All right, we got we got a, an attendee in, uh, in here. Welcome, Ashlyn. Um, we'll get started in just a second. Lisa will be joining us in just a second. I think she was on another call. Um, Where is? There we there go. Hello. Hey, hey. Happy Wednesday. Happy Wednesday. Hi, Matt. Laura, are you still figuring out Facebook? Um, no, we're on Facebook now. Yeah, we're we're um we're actually well, I'm pressing live in just a second. Okay, on the page, on the page, right? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Well, great to have you here, Matt. Um, I don't know if I Laura told you already, but we'll give people a couple of minutes to kind of um get into the Zoom call, and uh, we'll also be monitoring comments and questions inside our group. But yeah, usually until like 12 or 5, I think people will be uh, tuning in. Let me open our planning doc. We'll keep it very informal. And um, just always, I will always be kind of sometimes interrupting you and uh, jumping in to encourage everyone else to uh, jump in and ask questions. Anyone can ask questions either by politely interrupting, uh, unmuting yourself, don't forget to unmute yourself, or just dropping them in the chat, in the Zoom chat as well. And I can read it out if you want. Um, all right, yeah, let me quickly open our document and then... Um, yeah, maybe three more minutes for people to tune in and then we'll get going. That sounds great. I'm so excited to be with all of you guys. Yeah. Love me solo. So I think yeah. it's the perfect time. How many pairs do you have, Laura? I have two. I was saying I have like, I think I have like eight. Like I have like six to eight. I have like so <laughs> okay. many pairs of knee solos. <laughs> she's, out, she's out me soloing me, which I love. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, so um, fun. Yeah. And Mother's Day is around the corner. So you guys, so I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself and you can talk about all the Mother's Day specials you have and any gift ideas that Nisolo has planned. So feel free to mention that too. Um, but overall, yeah, just wanted to talk about the current state of ethical fashion. I know Fashion Revolution Week is just ended this Sunday, I think. Mm -hmm. And I wonder kind of what Nisola has been doing. I know you guys have been going above and beyond in terms of everything ethical fashion and what it really means to be an ethical brand these days. So I, I will be asking questions about all of the cool things that you've been doing over the years. And of course, uh, Brightly and I have been following you for a while. <laughs> for sure. And we are live on Facebook now. So it's happening. It looks like it's happening on our page and the group. I don't know. I'm not a huge Facebook expert. Um, although I probably should be being over here in Silicon Valley, but my husband used to work for them too. So you would think, but no, I'm not quite the expert. <laughs> Um, so Lisa, you want to just go ahead and get started? I mean, I think people are going to continue to drop in both on Facebook and on Zoom. Um, but yes, welcome everybody. This is a Brightly Coffee, uh, Changemaker Coffee Chat. For some reason, I always have the hardest time saying that. Um, but these were designed to bring our community together to discuss all things ethical and sustainable living in the midst of COVID-19. So we originally had a lot of different things planned in person, uh, both in um, the Bay Area and kind of around the United States. But unfortunately, COVID-19 happened and has been really hitting the entire world extremely hard in so many different ways. And so we thought, what better way to help uh, everybody come together for some positive conversation and thoughtful um, recommendations. Um, so this is how our coffee maker, coffee, ah, change maker, coffee maker chats <laughs> happened. <laughs> I literally can't do it. Uh, but yeah, so we're super excited to welcome Matt. Uh, he works with Nisolo, um, it specifically in their sustainability area. So Matt, I wondered if you could kind of just introduce yourself, let us know a little bit about um, what you do at Nisolo and maybe like how you got involved in the ethical fashion industry I and mean, it'd be fascinating. Yeah, I would love to do that. Well, happy Wednesday, everybody. Laura and Lisa, thank you so much for hosting me. I'm so grateful to get to be with you guys. And I love spaces like these where we get to just talk and learn from each other. I look forward to any questions and comments that you guys have. So as Laura was, met, was uh, saying, I'm the sustainability lead at Nisolo. Um, basically breaking my job down, it just really comes down to 
acknowledging that everything we make has an impact on people and the planet. My job is to figure out what that impact is and then to find creative ways to improve those impacts. So we genuinely believe at Nisolo that the fashion industry has the capacity to eradicate poverty around the world. There are tens of millions of people who make our clothes, 98% of whom are making a wage that holds them in poverty. And we dream about the day that all of those people are making a living wage and able to support their families. Um, on the people side, we really believe that our industry has the capacity as well to reverse climate change. Uh, fashion is responsible for about eight to 10% of the world's carbon emissions annually. And so we have a huge role to play as we think about how can we get more creative in sourcing the materials for our products in a more environmentally friendly way. And so I love the, the problems that we get to address on a day-to-day -day basis um, and the way that my role kind of gets to be integrated at Nisolo. I've been with the company for almost five years now. Um, it's been my first job out of college. I got really passionate about ethical fashion after spending a summer in um, India. I spent a summer working with an organization there and we were doing a lot of visits to, with um, different women specifically who were working in Indian clothing factories. And I remember one day outside of Bangalore, I went to this woman's home and there was a girl who was, um, she was 21 at the time, that was the same age as me. And she was telling me about what her future was gonna look like in terms of working in a factory. She was telling me that she would be earning $3 a day in this factory working for brands that you and I would recognize. and. In a, in a large way, she was very much grieving what she was, was losing as a result of um, the work that was ahead of her. She wanted to go to college and she had a lot of large aspirations. And I really was just uh, crushed in a lot of ways as I thought about the future that this woman wanted, uh, the resources that these brands who she was going to be making products for have, and then the, the uh, just really difficult reality of the poor wage that she was gonna make. Um, I'm not sure where she's at today. I wish I, I wish I knew. Um, but after having that conversation with her and a few other um, important experiences in my life, I got motivated to look at companies that were hiring and doing things differently. Um, Sony Solo hired me. I started as an intern and spent a year in our factory. We own and operate a factory where about 70% of our products come from, and that's down in Peru. And then after a year, I've been working stateside managing our social and environmental impact initiatives ever since. So that's the quick story awesome. of kind of how I got into this space. <laughs> I love how you, um, how your story really illustrates the human face of fashion. We've all become so divorced from the entire supply chain that makes up what goes on our bodies that it's really difficult for us to think through, um, you know, the impact that, you know, fair wages and, you know, responsible sourcing have on people. Um, the one thing that we've been saying that Lisa and I have said both internally and externally at Brightly is we're hoping um, one bright spot to come out of COVID-19 will be that people have kind of had the chance now to kind of reset and realize the impact of these supply chains that they didn't previously think about. Um, and I, I think about it also in terms of like local restaurants. Like I think we all have a favorite that we like to go to. Um, and we unfortunately are seeing, um, you know, sort of uh, cries for help from these businesses that we love to support on a local level. Um, so I'm hopeful that this line of thought is going to kind of then transition over into people having relationships with new brands like Me Solo that they might not have shopped with before and realize, hey, like next time I go out to buy a new pair of shoes or, um, you know, a handbag, I can actually make a difference with that. Um, and Matt, so I was wondering um, if you could speak a little bit to um, what Nisolo has been seeing happening since COVID-19 as it relates to your supply chain um, and maybe as it relates to the consumer response that you've seen, um, whatever you're comfortable sharing. Definitely. Yeah, no, I resonate a lot with what you just shared about the impacts of COVID-19. Um, it's been an amazing season, a difficult one for brands, but amazing in the sense of we've all known that fashion has been broken for a long time and this global crisis has really exposed the cracks in the system in a way that um, we have not seen before with the millions of jobs being lost in brand supply chains, orders being canceled. I think the most shocking thing for me as I think about the way that a lot of 
brands have responded is how many haven't even paid necessarily for uh, their POs yet, their placed orders um, from products that have already been made or that are in the process of being made. Um, so we've been affected at Nice Solo as well in a significant way. Our uh, founder and CEO, Patrick, put out a letter a few weeks ago sharing about some of the impacts that it's had on us. Um, the usual suspects of, you know, some layoffs, um, sales being down significantly, but we found that being transparent with our audience, sharing that update with them, um, really had a positive uh, response, not just from our community and encouraging us, but it's, it's had a really impactful uh, response as well in terms of sales and people uh, committing to continuing to buy from us and supporting us in that way. And I think the other thing that's been really neat for us, you know, amidst this challenge, um, when you would think uh, an organization's culture might be struggling, I really feel like our culture as a team right now is stronger than it's ever been. It's, it's really, for us, really exposed um, you know, how we are in times, in times of crisis. And for us, it's been a time to come together and say, even, even in this, in this time, we're going to be focusing on long-term initiatives because we recognize the importance of that. Um, and so last week, um, on Earth Day, on Wednesday, we committed to becoming a carbon negative through climate neutral. We're in the, uh, start of working through that. And, I've just been really grateful because I think where it can be really easy and understandable for brands to be focusing on the short term and staying afloat, um, we've been able to navigate this in a really neat way and continue to think through, no, we're in business for the vision to push this industry in a more sustainable direction. And regardless of the circumstances that we have, we're gonna confront them and, and really drive towards the long term. Um, and with our consumers, we're excited to see them kind of on the same page. So that's been really great. That's great. I mean, I've been telling Patrick and you that, um, you know, I think you guys, uh, I don't usually give compliments out. Uh, <laughs> Laura probably knows that. But I think because you've she's, been she's uh, doing... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just making fun of you. <laughs> But really, you guys have been such a great example of how brands should behave uh, and respond in a time of crisis. And I don't say it lightly, like being transparent is so important. And I think it pays off. And I think, uh, I mean, it's natural as human beings to be scared of uncertainty and not sure how to respond. And it's, it's hard to accept that being transparent is actually one of the best ways to behave. But I think over the years, you've been, as you said, you guys have been doing all the right things and kind of going above and beyond and really defining what it really means to be an ethical brand. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how do you guys uh, think of ethical fashion uh, kind of generally as a company internally? And maybe can you walk us through all the different initiatives that you've taken over the years? Because um, I believe you're not fair trade certified. So maybe you can also explain the logic behind that. You're a B Corp, you're now uh, climate neutral. Um, more on the way to be and there is another exciting initiative uh, that you launched last year so can you talk uh, to us about all of these amazing things that you've been doing definitely well thank you for those kind words lisa i really appreciate it there's an awesome article out too on um that question of what even is ethical fashion that the good trade put out yesterday i'm not sure if you guys have read that or not yet but i highly recommend checking out um that article um, for me, I think to be ethical and for Nisolo Solo as well, to be ethical means to realize our highest potential to care for people in the planet well. Um, that applies to all of us at a personal level. It applies to us at a brand level as well. Um, so I hit on this a little bit, but being an ethical brand um, is really recognizing that everything we make has an impact on people on the planet. It looks like measuring and improving um, those impacts. And I think it's I don't think ethical is such an issue um, of black and white, like we tend, can quickly think of it. I think that there's not necessarily an ethical brand and one that is not. Um, I think every brand is at a different place in its journey towards becoming as ethical as possible. Um, we believe it's really important, and you kind of hit on this a little bit, Laura. Um, we think it's really important to marry the two uh, between people and planet Maybe I'd add a third in there as well with um, transparency. One of the things that we, we struggle to see in our industry is um, compelling ways to engage consumers in these really um, tricky things that brands in the industry are navigating. And that's one of the biggest motivators for why we launched the Lowest Wage Challenge in partnership with um, another brand that's in Nashville, friends of ours at ABLE. 
Um, the lowest wage challenge is essentially a, a challenge to the rest of the industry to publish your lowest wages across your supply chain. Um, it was so to... clever. Like I, I, I love the way that you guys chose to shine a light on that. I just have to jump in because I think, you know, first of all, the wages that people are paid, you know, globally in the fashion supply chain would shock most people. Um, but I love that you guys took this, um, I don't know, this angle on it to say like, hey, here's what we're paying people. Everyone else, please come out and share. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry, I was a big fan of that. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, for those of you guys who haven't um, read up on that, just to be fully transparent, it's out there in public, our lowest wage in the factory that we own and operate in Peru is $280 a month. Um, that's a third party verified living wage for a single individual. And so these are shocking numbers for consumers to see when they think about what a wage is in the States or wherever they might be. But we saw a lot of good work being done on living wages by different organizations across our industry, industry experts. But we really recognize that consumers and customers are going to be the ones that determine brand behavior. And so it's only when consumers ask for a change, as we did with issues like child labor back in the 90s and early 2000s that we start to see significant improvement there. And so we have a long ways to go with wages and the lowest wage challenge has been a beautiful way of um, putting that out there into the world and collaborating with, with others to really get this moving. Um, should have said this earlier in the call too, but ni solo is a Spanish word. It means not alone. Um, it's really the recognition that changing this industry is going to require collaboration on a lot of different fronts, um, not just with consumers, but other ethical brands as well, and everyone that's being impacted in this space. So that was a big initiative that we launched. Um, we've done a lot of other things as well over the course of the last um, few months with committing to becoming carbon negative. We also launched an ethical marketplace on our website too with um, 21 other brands where we're featuring products for your home, um, other apparel and things like that as well. Also, if any of you guys are um, looking to purchase from anything from Nisolo, we have a site-wide discount going on right now. If you uh, type in brightly, all caps at checkout. Um, so we saw that ethical marketplace is a good opportunity to, to start pushing um, industry in the right direction. That's awesome. We have a few questions and comments from people. And yeah, I just want to remind everyone, don't be shy to jump in um, and uh, unmute yourself or post them in the chat box. So Rachel is uh, saying such an amazing way to call out other brands to do better or if they're doing well to celebrate that. That's about the you know minimum wage initiative. And then Madeline is asking, uh, do you find more fast fashion shoe brands you interact with are following your example slowly? What kind of conversations have you had with fast fashion brands if any yeah we have not had that many conversations with fast fashion brands um that's been one of the and i am all ears as well for any ideas on in getting in closer communication with some of those brands um i think we're seeing i'm i'm excited because you know i see sustainability becoming a growing movement of course there's a lot of greenwashing but we're kind of coming to a crossroads where even these fast fashion brands are going to need to be taking on positive initiatives to um, continue to get the market. And so I worry about greenwashing. I worry about the effectiveness of a lot of those initiatives, but at least the conversation is starting to shift that way. So yeah, that, that comes up frequently. And actually, I've thought about this a lot, too. Um, I had the opportunity to work for Sephora um, for a little bit before I started Brightly. And while Sephora isn't fashion necessarily, they are owned by the LVM LVMH Corporation. Um, and so while I was there, um, I was also, I mean, I was like had the idea for Brightly, was kind of starting to build it up, was really interested in, um, in ethical fashion. And so I started to try and poke in to see... Um, how people make decisions at big companies like that and like why they weren't actually having these types of conversations. And I think there's part of it is just truly because they're these huge corporations and oftentimes there's not necessarily one decision maker in that realm. I am, am um, encouraged by 
uh, bigger corporations now bringing on heads of sustainability, um, like your your uh, your position, but at much larger corporations to um, you know start to think about that. I mean, I do know that H and M, uh, while it's a huge fast fashion offender, um, did start something called the H and M Foundation, uh, where they do provide grants and funding to startups who are trying to do things in places like the circular economy. So, like, yes, to your point, like, I there's. I'm, I'm excited by some of these conversations happening. Do I think um, we need to change on a much broader level? Of course. And actually I'm, I'm like, I'm sad that you haven't been approached by some of these brands as like the experts in um, ethical supply chain, specifically in um, shoes and handbags, but I'm not that surprised, unfortunately. Womp womp. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I always like to say though, even though maybe there is no conversations happening with fast fashion brands, but the fact that they H and M included and starting those conscious collections and sustainability in initiative, it, it's thanks to, to brands like Nissol, fair trade brands, ethical brands, uh, taking market share from these big companies. Uh, you know, uh, ultimately, I don't want to say that, but you know, most of the time they only care about revenue and once you start taking revenue from them they start listening um, but again we've talked about it probably almost every other coffee chat like COVID-19 is all is a global reset that's how we see it mm -hmm. we see how much people care and starting to realize uh, how important the their spending habits are and what real difference we can make uh, in the fate of businesses, local businesses, businesses like Nisolo, or even giant corporations are not doing that well uh, right now. So um, I, I think there is um, there is even a bigger consumer shift happening. Uh, there was another question from Ashlyn. Um, have any other brands, it's kind of similar, have any other brands jumped into the challenge, um, ethical or not, I'm guessing, and then I'm part of the, uh, Ashlyn is saying, I'm part of the Fashion Revolution USA team and would like to to help you grow this are you are you unable able to are you unable able to coach other brands <laughs> oh thank you ashlyn i'm stoked on that we'll have to connect another time um, on what that could look like yeah we've gotten a lot of interest we've got um about 15 brands that are hoping to publish we were their lowest wage we were really wanting to get that out in the world um week before fashion revolution week and it just didn't between um, when COVID-19 hit all of us in early March, uh, brands were pretty limited on time to get some of that information our way and, and really commit what they, uh, what they needed to to help us advance in that. And for us, we postponed it largely because we want it to be a big watershed moment for the industry as we all come out with these wages together. And so we just didn't feel like that date was, was um, ideal but yeah we have a lot of brands that are very interested um, and are always looking for more to come on board too so we're still working to set a specific date when we're going to release all of that information um, but we see it as a really long-term project um, the goal is for it not to be like a shock the consumer campaign it'll be something that's kind of rolling where different brands will share their lowest wage and uh, become a committed brand we hope to see that grow to the point that it becomes a new normal for customers to see the lowest wage next to a living wage on whatever they purchase. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. Um, I had a question for you, not quite related to um, COVID-19 or anything, but it's one that somebody asked me recently and I thought, hmm. Um, so as you think about developing new products um, for New Solo, uh, how often do you take into account um, the what is available locally um, with your artisan supply chains and sort of what is that, what does that process look like? Um, I, I thought it'd be interesting. Yeah, definitely. We are always looking to innovate with our products. Um, we've been in leather, which is a tricky raw material for those of you guys who have done much research into leather. There can be a lot of environmental issues with it if you don't source responsibly. Um, there are animal welfare issues as well if you're not knowledgeable of the farms that you're sourcing from as well. And so we've done a lot of research to get the traceability across our supply chain. There's still a lot of work that needs to take place there as well. Um, but we're constantly looking at alternative materials too. We had to, um, someone asked a question to, yeah, this one from Rachel, of whether there was a time you ran into something at Nisolo that was wrong or that you needed to change. And that kind of ties into that question that you're asking, Laura, because as we think about sourcing locally, 
uh, for quite a long time, we were sourcing a lot of our leather hides from Peru. And unfortunately, the tanneries, the tanneries are the uh, factories that are basically treating the hides. Um, the more we dug into the tanneries practices, we found that they weren't doing a thorough enough job um, for us when it came to treating their wastewater. And so we had to, when we saw that that wasn't up to par where we wanted it to be, we had to move quite a bit of our supply chain um, out to Mexico and then sourcing from leather from the US as well, um, just because they were doing a much better job environmentally with animal welfare, with the way they were treating their hides as well. And so fortunately for us, we, um, I think we have a more consolidated supply chain than most brands. Almost everything in our operations takes place in the Americas, so in the Western Hemisphere. Um, that cuts a lot of travel out when you think about a t-shirt, for example, where the cotton might go, might be coming from a field in Texas and being shipped out to Southeast Asia to get processed into textile and then sewn and sent back and whatnot. Um, so it is a little bit more consolidated, but yeah, we're always trying to think through more ways that we can consolidate our supply chain even further. Yeah, it's definitely once once you are sourcing from, you know, different supply chains, especially around the world, that makes everything so, so much more complicated. And that's why I have always been looking up to Nisolo in terms of, you know, owning your own factory in production. It just means that you have so much more control. But even with this reality, there is still all these little details. And um, again, that you guys are so thoughtful about all the tiny details in the production, uh, it just adds up. Um, so huge deal. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, feel free to jump in with any questions for Matt. We're talking about the current state of ethical fashion, about uh, New Solo, you know, how to create products sustainably and ethically, about their different initiatives. So feel free to um, jump in with any questions uh, in this realm. And then on our end, um, as you guys know, for those of you who've been listening to the podcast, participating in the coffee chats, we always kind of, uh, our goal is to leave everyone that comes uh, in touch with Brightly with actionable tips uh, for that you can implement in your everyday life and kind of change your, sometimes your behavior and uh, thinking as a consumer, as a citizen. So the question is, how can we as citizens and consumers be more conscious Conscious and lead a more ethical lifestyle during COVID-19 and beyond. And Matt can be your personal tips and tricks. It can also be, you know, some things that you guys have been discussing internally with Nisol and things that you've learned along the way too. Definitely. Yeah. I think it's such an interesting season of life because all of us have spent so much time in our homes. Um, you probably realize things in your home that you don't use or need anymore. I, I feel like a lot of people kind of got done with their spring cleaning the first or the second week of all of this. Amen. <laughs> I know I come through a lot of my own stuff. Um, I think the first thing is, is really just looking at where, how can I lead a minimalistic life? Um, as I think about fashion, looking at that in terms of clothes, I've had a fun experiment that I've been working on for the last uh, it's it's ongoing, but it's been going for the last four or five years. I've gotten to travel a lot and I wanted to see if I could have more passport stamps than I have pieces of clothing in my um, closet, including like pairs of socks and shoes and everything. And I finally hit my goal in like mid 2018. Um, it was like, I think I've got 135 pieces of clothing now, um, but creating some kind of fun like checks and balance system of making sure that you're not over consuming above a certain limit. And um, I think identifying those pieces of clothing too, that like you really want to have more of a relationship with that you build memories with as well. I love the um, Love Clothes Last campaign that Fashion Revolution is working on because it is such a key part of our identity and who we are, um, our clothing. So that would be one on the personal level. Um, really be reaching out to brands too. I think when I, when I, when people ask me the question of, you know, how can you tell a brand is ethical or not, um, ask them those really tough questions that they might not want to answer and see if they get back to you and see what they share. So I think that's a great one as well. Um, and then getting creative too about different projects you can be starting around the house. Um, I want to start composting and getting that going and I don't know, there's so many great areas in our lives where we can just be doing a better job and what a better, there's no better season than this one to be 
reflective about the kind of world we want to step back into and the kind of the kinds of habits that we want to change to as we've been dealing with a lot of change and we've been forced to deal with so yeah I love it. it. It sounded almost like you've been reading brightly because we had we just launched a podcast on minimalism uh, with another podcaster um, who hosts ho her whole podcast about minimalism living. So I, I dropped the link below there. Uh, we just po posted a, uh, an article about composting too, written by one of our brightly ambassadors, and uh, we are planning to uh, also. Well, actually, I'm interviewing. Joe the gardener, I'm very excited about that. <laughs> uh, he has a podcast and a TV show about gardening because so many folks are getting into uh, the gardening. They, everyone is developing green thumbs, so that's exciting. Um, well, and Lisa, I mean, you, you never forget, right? Like one of the biggest pieces of advice we try to give on the podcast is just consume less um, and, you know, just buy fewer, better things. Um, you know, I think oftentimes um, accessibility um, from a price point comes into play uh, when people think about ethical fashion. And we get that question a lot, which is like, yeah. how do I participate in the ethical fashion um, consumption cycle when I don't necessarily have a budget for it? And so a lot of the times our advice is, you know, like, a, if you want to support um, these ethical brands on the secondhand market, you can totally do so um, and get things, you know, and, you know, so A, you're getting an ethical item, but B, it's being reused, which is great. Um, another thing is, you know, watch for discounts. Um, so like we do have one live with me solo right now, which is awesome. I'm um, just right brightly at the checkout, um, but, you know, discounts and then also save saving up. Um, so for Christmas, I oftentimes like to ask my family to um, help contribute towards like one big item that I want. I wanted one of those really cool, um, like big wide brim hats. Um, <laughs> and I was like, did not trust any one person to either like A, want to pay, pay that much money for me or B, like give me the right hat. So it was just like, I took a picture of myself and like photoshopped it with the hat just to be silly. And I was like, please everyone <laughs> contribute to this hat fun. Um, and they did, except then I forgot to buy the hat. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still sitting there. I have a little hat fund, um, but you know, just being creative about, um, you know, what you, what you purchase. And then sitting, uh, we, have, Lisa and I had somebody else in the podcast, Lisa, I can't remember who it was now, but they had a, they had a rule where maybe it was Catherine from going zero waste. I think um, she mentioned like having a rule where she would give herself like a two week waiting period before she'd buy something. So like, you know, okay, made the decision to buy it. Now let's wait two weeks to see if we want it later. <laughs> Or the 30 uh, wear rule, I'm sure, Matt, you guys have talked a lot about it. You know, um, obviously we want to uh, make ethical consumption as accessible as possible. But of course, uh, when you're paying uh, the factory workers, the artisans, real uh, above living wages, you know, you have to price the products accordingly. Uh, but it, so in terms of consumer, we have to do a lot of education work and Nisolo has been doing a ton of it. But yeah, think about that in, uh, as buying quality products that you've been, you will be wearing for many, many years to come. Um, I always give an example, obviously new solo shoes is a great example, if you, especially if you take care, that you have care instructions on all of your packaging. Um, example of like a Patagonia jacket that my husband was like, I will never wear it uh, ever. Um, you know, I'm not gonna be one of the San Francisco people wearing Patagonia jacket. And then he bought it three years ago. It's like about $300, but he wore it every single day. So it's, it's like it's like 3000 <laughs> wears out of this jacket, you know? So thinking about quality versus quantity. And yeah, just uh, as you said, like, you know, start with what you have, start with your wardrobe, where you are and what your needs are. Um, the thing I wanted to share too, yeah. um, Patagonia has done a great job of this with their worn wear program where they receive used clothes um, of their brand and then sell it for yeah. a cheaper price. Um, we're starting to get into that. Um, we hope to move into that, um, something similar to that eventually, but Awesome. We recognize that the price is a big barrier for a lot of people to start consuming a little bit more ethically. And so one of the things that we just started doing last week was actually selling some of our shoes on Poshmark. Um, so we have a lot of shoes, like, for example, that we use in a model sh in a photo shoot wow. um, where they're lightly worn and still very much you can you can tell they've been worn, but um, they're still very new and and ready to wear. And so it becomes a way for us. We've had a success with that program so far and 
becomes a way for us to um, get new customers, but then also on the consumer side to purchase an ethically made product for significantly less than what it would be otherwise. Ooh, that's such a hot yeah. tip. Everyone's going to be running to Poshmark now. That's amazing. <laughs> well, it's almost like a, it's like a digital sample sale too, which is yeah. nice too, right? Like I feel like um, I've had the opportunity to go to a few sample sales in my life and it's kind of like an insane stampede. Um, so half the time, like the, ver well, the, di the, I'm sorry, the in-person ones, the digital ones are pretty good too, but, uh, that's yeah. awesome. I love, I love that idea. I think it's even worth asking brands if there's ones that you're curious about emailing their team and saying, is there any items of clothing or whatever that could be slightly damaged or that you just want to get off of your hands, they will want the revenue. And I think there's, there's a lot of ways to get creative around that. So it's pretty fun. Great. Madeline has a question. Uh, I love that one. Uh, Matt, do they, do your guy friends shop ethical fashion? Is this a topic you chat about with them? I always find that it's less discussed um, among men and I'm curious to see what your experience has been. That's such a good question. Yeah. Most of my friends are surfers who are only buying thrift clothes <laughs> so a lot of <laughs> that's amazing a lot of a lot of them are buying um second hand i do have i do have a lot who are purchasing ethical fashion though but it is definitely it's an area that we need to see a lot more growth in that's such a good observation um because yeah it's not as i'm not sure necessarily why i feel like um yeah a lot of my guy friends aren't if they're buying a new product, they're not necessarily looking for um, that ethical option necessarily. So, yeah, yeah. I've actually heard um, on that topic, my husband and I talk about this a lot. And I think there are so many different ways to convert people to becoming wearers of ethical fashion. And of course, like a lot of times it's values alignment. Sometimes it's um, from a thrifting perspective. Sometimes it's more of a budgetary type reasoning. Um, but I think there might be an interesting piece of psychology here too, which is thinking through like how the consumer shopping paths differ between men and women. Um, and I think just from, um, you know, all of my friends that are guys and my husband, everybody that I kind of um, are in my circle, people seem to um, make decisions primarily based off like a lot of research and like gear and like getting really interested in like mm. how something is made and things of that nature. And so sometimes I think, um, in addition to needing more brands that are putting um, this type of product forward, we also kind of need to attack it as an industry from maybe a different messaging perspective too. Um, one of our favorite brands in our house is United by Blue. Um, mm -hmm. They make some amazing um, you know, clothing for actually mostly for men. Um, they have a little bit of women's stuff and they also make really fun pet collars um, out of recycled plastic. So all of our pets are rocking some pretty cool United by gear. I mean, not United by Blue gear. So That's anyway, fun. just a thought. <laughs> Local to you guys in the Bay Area, uh, but Huckberry is an amazing email as well as subscribe to um, for men yeah. specifically. Yeah, Huckberry. Yeah, we were talking about that with Laura a while back. Um, yeah, Ashley had, an, uh, had one suggestion. Eco Stylist is a menswear platform for ethical fashion, so check them out. And um, uh, we will be wrapping up in like five minutes or so. Um, but one of the questions we love asking our podcast guests, and I thought it would be fun to ask you, uh, Matt. Outside of Nisol, I'm curious, uh, what are some things that you're most excited about um, in the ethical fashion, environmental sustainability space in general? Some brands or campaigns, um, things that really get you excited? Definitely. Yeah, I love what's happening right now in the regenerative agriculture space. I think that it's been such an exciting way to see um, how we can use that in fashion and how we can use that to reverse climate change as well. Because I think one of my biggest concerns as I look at the environmental impacts of fashion is at the raw materials level. Um, so I get really excited about the way that the agriculture is gonna change for both um, the food industry and then for fashion as well. And so I know that Patagonia is championing a lot of that regenerative agriculture. What is the, um, it's not thread up. There's, there's a farm close to you guys a little bit. I think it's in Mendocino. Um, oh, I know what you're talking about. Is fiber shed? Fiber shed. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Their stuff is rad. So yeah. innovative. Um, so I think it's just more than anything coming around um, those really innovative means of sourcing our products and 
I just feel like there's been a lot of positive progress happening in product circularity. It feels like the last several years, we've really been trying to figure out how to really have that complete circular model. So we're still figuring that out ourselves with um, um, our shoes and whatnot. But I like that everyone generally kind of seems to be on the same page of, of where we want to be moving towards. And I feel like COVID-19 is bringing in the consumer in a really engaging way. So I am a hopeless optim, not hopeless optimist. I don't think that's the, that is not the way to phrase that. I'm a reckless optimist, how that said, uh, to a fault. And so I have a lot of just hope for the future and the direction that we're going. Hey, that's awesome. Like a little bit of optimist. I've never heard anybody, right? <laughs> yeah, but I yeah. think, Laura, we, we've been talking about this. Uh, you know, obviously it's uh, it's hard to be not optimistic when you are inside such an amazing company. You know, you're talking with uh, people really trying to make a difference uh, and, you know, going above and beyond. So like that's, uh, we can totally understand why you're an optimist. But I think on the other end, um, we at Brighton love to kind of um, make sure that everybody knows about that, you know, We've been in the ethical brand space for a while, so in a kind of a bubble, and we've been saying that it's a moment of sustainability. Now, 2019, 18, now 2020, and then COVID-19, that really shows that sustainability is like really here to stay, even despite the global pandemic. And I think the fact that we're seeing brands like Nisolo going above and beyond in terms of their sustainability initiatives. And like Patagonia, like I think you guys have the similar thinking and I'm guessing, you know, you aspire to be uh, like Patagonia in terms of um, that saying that nobody is perfect, right? Even Patagonia, who everybody is kind of, uh, we all grew up to look up to them. Even they are saying we're not perfect, but we are moving towards the right place. Um, so I think, I think for real now, for real now, sustainability is here to stay. Um, and, you know, there was Earth Day last week, Fashion Revolution has, is just over. Um, but I think every single year we see more and more momentum. And the coolest thing that I, uh, I like to give example of, um, brands or people who are thinking about starting brands that don't know much about sustainability, they're not in the sustainability bubble, even they understand that they have to somehow be sustainable because consumers are demanding it from them, um, which is great. Uh, if anyone has any uh, last minute questions, whether on Facebook um, or you can unmute yourself and chat with us or you can post them in the chat box, uh, we can answer them live. Um, otherwise, Laura, do you have any other questions for Matt? I don't think so, um, but Matt, so if people want to um, get more involved with what Nisolo uh, is, is up to, how can they do that other than shopping, of course? <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, if you guys want to contact me about any of our sustainability initiatives, my contact info is just my name, Matt, M-A-T-T, -T, at nisolo.com. So feel free to shoot me an email. There's a lot of amazing people on here already. I know I saw a comment from uh, Remake already and some Fashion Revolution stuff. So feel free to be in touch with me. We're regularly posting to our Stride blog on our site as well. That's usually where we share kind of our most long form um, copy about any social and environmental initiatives that we're doing. And um, yeah, just stay, uh, yeah, be, uh, be on the lookout as well. We've got a pretty major thing that we'll be sharing in the next few weeks as well for the Ooh. fashion industry, another big campaign. Um, awesome. I'm really excited to release that. Yeah. Yeah. We'd love to help get the word out about that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Matt, thank you so much for joining us. Um, like I said, we, we have so many fans of ethical fashion in the Bright Lake community. We also get so many questions about it. So we knew that this was going to be an awesome talk. Um, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, we will be doing another coffee chat next week. Um, and it will be about clean beauty. I oh, know yes. Another clean hot beauty. topic in sustainability. It will be with Tyla Abbott. Um, her na brand name is called Ether Beauty. She is in Sephora. She's actually ex Sephora uh, employee, but she created a whole, her own clean beauty, uh, including packaging. So a zero waste, mm -hmm. everything is recyclable, clean beauty brand. So we're also excited about that. Uh, let's keep the momentum going. And um, I hope you guys stay safe and be well. Yes. And thank you so much for all for joining us this Wednesday. Yes. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Bye.